what we're going to do here today is uh, really have an opportunity, I think, to hear from two companies that when I work with clients, I talk about them every time. Uh, vSnap, which is a video communications platform and is uh, fantastically compelling around uh, driving consumer interaction and engagement. And uh, Nanigans uh, with uh, Dan Slagan here, uh, who uh, works for this great company that's remaking how uh, digital advertising, particularly in social media, works. So the big topic is customers and getting more value for our relationship out of them. And uh, though we're going to you know, hear from two people who have great tools, they're also great marketers. Dave's an entrepreneur. Dan is a fantastically talented uh, advertising manager and marketer. Uh, both know about brands. And really, the fun here is going to be the interaction. So we're going to have Q&A going on throughout the day. Uh, I keep hearing the word big data. And uh, I kind of had a new rule that every time I hear big data, people have to drink coffee. So I think today, like, customer is probably that word. Uh, in, in our culture, off and on, we go through these kind of spurts of CEO uh, worship. And uh, I think that the natural tonic to that is customer worship. And uh, when you walk in a, a company and you find people who are proximate to customers, that's almost always a good deal. Uh, because if you think about your company, its physical assets may be very important. If you're in manufacturing or an industry like that, physical assets are huge. Mm -hmm. But relationship assets often dwarf the physical assets. We're going to talk about some of the ways uh, that you can measure the value of those relationships and make sure they're going in the right way. So enough about customers. There are a couple reasons why I think about customers, uh, perhaps more than I might have in the past. Uh, one is the rate of change, both in technology and in our economy. That shifts the balance of power away from brands that are long-living and well-established to customers that are able to change markets. And uh, I put this headline up. This was something I was thinking about today. Right now, healthcare and education are probably the two business sectors in greatest change. Would everyone agree with that? Huge change going on, especially you know, this week. Uh, healthcare is 18% of US GDP. Uh, education is about 9% of GDP. So we're seeing 27% of our gross domestic product right now uh, re-engineering the way its business models work. And who's going to vote on that? Who's going to decide it works? It's going to be customers, and it's going to be you know, both established players and also young challengers. So there's a lot of power in the hands of customers because there's some very big change going on. And you know, the idea that nearly a third uh, of our economy, both business and consumer, is being re-engineered is a really big deal. And this uh, makes this a, an important time for marketers. The other thing is the technology change. And if I had to bucket that change into two buckets, one is information agility. People, when they show up to shop, when they engage, in your, uh, when they engage with, your with your company, already know a lot. The day of uh, the brand holding the power and the consumer uh, only going to the brand for information is long since gone. And they're transactionally empowered so they can shop anywhere on Earth. And uh, they can repeat their opinion, uh, even if it's a minority opinion, uh, in a way that reaches around the world. And if you have 1% or 2% of a customer base uh, that is aggrieved, they will find each other. And they will make their voice heard uh, to your leadership, and if they're not listened to, elsewhere. So even though we're talking about customer relationship, you know, I think there's a, a big social layer uh, to be thinking about also. Finally, if we think back 20 years ago, there was a lot of talk about bricks and clicks, people moving from stores to selling stuff online. And that's an old idea. And I don't think anyone in that day had imagined that we'd actually be moving from having products made of atoms to really having the thing that people make their selections based on. It's the service design, the non-atom layer that goes on above products. And three products that are great examples of this that just you know, I want to illustrate this idea of service design, is by nature, everything sold at a pharmacy is standard. You can't get better heart medication at one pharmacy. It would mess up the medical system. Uh, but you can change the service design. So the fact that Walgreens makes it easier to reorder uh, a 
prescription by just scanning a barcode on the bottle and you don't have to call up dial numbers or anything uh, is something that becomes a differentiating advantage. Not the atoms, you know, but the service layer above them. Same with GE, and I won't go through the GE story, but if you're a pilot and you're flying with a GE jet engine, uh, if there's a problem with the jet engine and you pull out your app, in 15 minutes you have a design engineer on the phone. In four hours you get a new part for your engine anywhere you are in the US. They pre-cache parts, they do fabrication with 3D printing. GE isn't changing its jet engines, but it's making them more valuable through service design. And finally, I had a chance to spend time with a digital director from the Mayo Clinic. And what's interesting is they're looking at what are the big areas for changing the way healthcare gets delivered. The answer isn't change the doctors. It's not make the doctor 2% more effective because we've always done that and the doctors are good at that. It's adding in data and mobile devices for being able to gather richer information using behavioral science in order to help people actually make the healthy changes that they know they need to make which makes the doctor's job a lot better. And then having coaching and ongoing support and even social engineering between patients and families so people feel supported during that process. And people are journey mapping out uh, the patient experience in uh, great detail at Mayo Clinic. So in all three of these things, they're not changing the core of their business, but they're adding a great deal of value by the way they connect with customers. I won't go deep into this, but there's a lot of data that shows that happy customers make companies grow faster. And Bain does research on this. Uh, Gartner, I'm sorry, Forrester is on the right. Temkin Group actually breaks it down by industry to say, uh, do happy customers provide less churn, additional purchases, or recommendations through advocacy? So the idea that happy people will do business with companies uh, is uncontroversial and shouldn't be a surprise. The real surprise is uh, how many companies are making incremental growth rather than really addressing customer experiences that need fixing. And we'll talk about this later. The question that emerges there is that the incumbents will continue to progress like that top line from Clay Christensen. Uh, but people who are making more transformational moves will eventually gain ground. And the question is, can you not address customer experience with an economy that's moving, with technology that's changing? Your opportunity to differentiate is probably not rearranging the atoms of the product that gets sold. It almost certainly is providing some type of system that's structuring the human interactions uh, as a conduit uh, to allow your company to scale and change the way they deal with, com with customers. So that's my little preamble. Uh, the fact I'm up here with two companies that provide tools does not mean we're gonna be talking about tools. It's not about the hammer. It's about the plan and what you're building with the hammer. Uh, this isn't, I think it was Jason O. Wang who had, uh, what was it? Uh, fondling, don't fondle the hammer was his advice. So you know what we're really talking about is this big customer experience strategy with uh, two leaders who are innovators here in Boston uh, who've thought about this a lot and uh, have some methods uh, that may be uh, welcome in your bag of tricks. Uh, so, if you would, uh, please tweet us in these locations. We'll do a book drawing at the uh, end of Q&A. We'll have Q&A scattered through the presentations. And I'd like to uh, introduce first uh, Dan Slagan, Senior Vice President at Nanigans, uh, who's gonna talk a little bit uh, about advertising and being smart about acquiring the right customers. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, Who wants to want to make sure everyone can hear me? In the back? Good? All right, perfect. So if you guys are not familiar with Nanigans, uh, we are software as a service uh, based here in Boston. Uh, we're pioneering the concept of uh, predictive lifetime value for performance marketing at scale. Uh, so we're a SaaS platform. Uh, we work with over 250 advertisers globally, including eBay, Fab.com. Our big uh, verticals are e-commerce, retail, travel, and we mostly play in performance marketing across both social and mobile. Uh, we're the number one spender on Facebook. We do over a quarter billion dollars a year. Uh, we have 130 um, employees right now, uh, mostly based out of Boston, with offices in London, here of course, uh, New York, and San Francisco. That's all about the company. So for the most part, we are just looking at performance marketing. When we started the company three years ago, we looked at performance marketing and we said inherently it was broken start to finish. 
The reason was this. When we're looking at performance marketing and we're typically talking about customer acquisition, what we see most advertisers and most methodologies focusing on today is a concept of cost per acquisition. So here you have a gentleman up top who you could acquire for $4. You have a woman who was the mother here on the bottom you could acquire for $7. If you're optimizing towards a CPA-based algorithm, you're typically going to scale and look for more people that would cost $4 as opposed to $7 because it's going to be cheaper up front now. However, that's not at all indicative of future behavior or future value. The second way we're seeing people at least now start to come to market is the concept of same-day ROI, single purchase. So again, you have the gentleman up top who perhaps he makes two purchases of shirts, and you have a woman on the bottom who makes only one purchase of the shoes. If you were looking at ROIs of today, the gentleman up top would be the more attractive audience because he spent more. However, again, not necessarily indicative of future value or future behavior. So what we focus on and what our tool really focuses on is customer lifetime value. And while the concept of customer lifetime value is not new, it's really the first time that the technology has been here. So using predictive-based uh, algorithms, we really just put focus on a six-week purchase cycle, a 12-week purchase cycle, really looking at the customer lifetime value. And so the way we really think about it is it's not customer acquisition, and we really stand by this, it's, it's customer investment. And if you think about investments, you wouldn't think about penny stocks, you'd think about long-term investments. So we often work with our advertisers to increase CPAs, increase CPCs, increase your upfront costs, because we know over time it's going to be a better bet, it's going to be a better investment. So these are the customers that we're bringing into our advertisers on a daily basis. This really is what we want to focus on. Anytime we're working with the customer, we want to start at the end. We want to understand the business goals. So in this example, this is looking at one of our retailers. And you can see on a daily basis, we're taking a look here at spend. So for instance, on November 21st, we're spending $11,000. We like to take a look at purchases. We like to take a look at CPCs. But really, the focus is here, day one through seven, taking a look at your revenue that's going to be generated over time. So it's interesting to note how much you're going to make back on your first day. It's a lot more interesting to take a look, as I mentioned, at, at the lifetime value and really track. And by looking at it this way, you can then go back and you can say, all right, what worked particularly well in this campaign that you can then apply to future campaigns and learnings? That's really the focus here. So where exactly are these people? Where are we playing for the most part? It's social and mobile. And the running joke in our industry is that it's been sort of the year of mobile for the past five years. Um, this year actually is the first time it actually is. So the numbers I have on the screen here, this is for Nanigans. This is our mobile revenues as a company for the last four quarters. So you can see right now, since we play 100% on Facebook 12 months ago, we didn't have any revenue coming in off mobile. Now it's 46%. So at this point, we really have to think about omnichannel. Because if we're thinking about social and mobile, where exactly are these people? They're going to be on their phones. They're going to be on their desktops. They're going to be on their tablets. But they're also going to be on TV. They're going to be offline. And so that's what we're seeing a lot of our advertisers <clears throat> working on now is connecting all the different channels. So a couple examples of that. eMarketer uh, released a report just a couple weeks ago saying that 15 to 17% of people in between the ages of 18 and 34 are consistently socializing on their phones while watching TV. We saw last year with the Super Bowl commercial on the bottom, we saw 30 Super Bowl commercials include a shout out to social media, whether it was Twitter or whether it was Facebook. This is the prime time location for any of these advertisers. And you can see some examples on the right from M&M to Doritos. We're talking about $3.5 million for a 30 second spot that typically they're spending the majority of their year thinking about. So people are willing to now put social and mobile at the forefront of their most important ad campaigns on an annual basis. Another example, we work with a handbag company, uh, Henry Bendel based out of, this was in New York, uh, back in Fashion Week a couple weeks ago. And so they wanted to run an exclusive campaign based out of New York, and so they worked with one of our advertisers, fab.com, and what they wanted to do was have an exclusive offer in which they had a handbag that you could only get either in store or on Facebook. So they, again, they drove people using Facebook right to their store on their mobile, or they could make a purchase uh, online. But again, the concept of omni-channel, thinking about both both on and offline. Uh, Bud Light, this came out just last week. Uh, this is an interesting concept just because we're now starting to see some of these larger brands, especially the national brands, be nationally local. And so while they're, of course, located across the country, they ran a couple geo-specific uh, campaigns here where they were driving people from social to their in-store. And using a company called Data Logix, if you guys haven't heard, they're really at the forefront of tracking the on to offline. Uh, they were able to, I believe it was 6x uh, their revenue just from driving people in specific geos from online to their in-stores and, and boost sales. So just a couple examples of, of some of the brands that we're seeing. 
Now, the one thing in ad tech uh, and performance marketing that always gets left behind is the fact that there's humans behind the computer. Is that, yes, we can put an ad in front of anyone that you want, and we can do that at scale, and we can make sure that the targeting is relevant, and we'll get into targeting in a bit. But the one thing we have to keep in mind is that we can't make the user click on the ad. We still have to think about enchanting people. We, feel, we still have to think about inspiring people, and we still have to think about connecting with people. So just a couple examples of large brands that we've been really impressed with of late. I don't know if you guys have seen, show hands, the, the Guinness commercial with everyone playing basketball in, in, in wheelchairs. So if you haven't seen this, a couple people have. So if you haven't seen this, it's, it's a 30 second clip, and there's six guys playing wheelchair basketball. And at the end, five of the six guys stand up. And then as a collective group of friends, they all go to the bar, because one of them was handicapped. Absolutely fantastic way to connect with people, and absolutely brilliant message. Uh, Dove, any show of hands if you guys saw the Dove sketches? So the majority of the room. Uh, but again, that concept there, real quick, was just that they wanted to understand how women view themselves versus how other women view them. And what they found was that women typically think of themselves as mundane, a little bit closed off. They're very shy around how they, how they look physically, whereas other women, when they see them, they see them as happy, wanting to connect more vibrant individuals. And so that was another fantastic way that they just brought that experience to life. So first and foremost, when we're working with our advertisers, yes, we'll get your message in front of the right person. Yes, we'll scale. Yes, there will be revenue. But it has to be around fantastic creative. Uh, there's not a more exciting time right now to work for a creative shop, whether it's video, whether it's static, whether it's social, mobile, whatever it may be. Creative has never been more important. Uh, once you have sort of your concept down, there's really three things that we focus on with our advertisers. So if you think about whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on Twitter, uh, you know, you're going to be on the site for a myriad of different reasons. What's the first thing that someone's really going to stop and say, I want to pay attention to this ad or this offer? It's going to be aesthetics. And this is really interesting. If you think about Facebook, if you're scrolling down through your newsfeed, what's going to stop and make you look? It's going to be the imagery. And this is really when you start to say, all right, this is interesting to me. Next, you're going to take a look at the language. You're going to look at the ad copy. And this is going to be the consideration stage. So now you've stopped, you've viewed the imagery, and now you're going to start to read what the actual offer is. This is where we start to talk to people about exclusive offers, wherever they're running. We talk to them about urgency, countdown creative, sales, those types of things. But now that you've taken a look and you've said, this is interesting to me, I'm considering it, the last piece that really is a decision maker, of course, is going to be the relevancy factor. This is when people say, this is interesting, I like the ad copy, but I'm going to do anything. Um, during July 4th, I saw a fantastic ad. It was for children's clothing. A really cute image of, of a kid dressed up in all you know, July 4th America clothes. Uh, I don't have a child. So for me, the relevancy wasn't there. I appreciated the ad. It was very well done, but it was not placed well. So I didn't take an action. So how do we ensure relevancy? That's where targeting comes into play. Unprecedented targeting going on right now in social. So in terms of demographics and device, this is nothing new. We're all used to seeing these things as advertisers. What's really starting to come into fruition now and what we're focusing on is everything on the other side. So affinities, understanding what people like, who they're following, what they're following, what their interests are, the types of conversations they're having, uh, what their behavior is, social when it comes to relationship status, where they work, where they went to school, um, who they work for, those types of things. And the final piece, uh, CRM. So for instance, on Facebook, you can now upload email databases. So we can go to our customers and we can say, Give us a list of your best email addresses that represent your best performing customers. We can upload that list into Facebook, uh, soon, soon to be Twitter, and they will spit back the exact demographic of what that audience looks like online so that we can then start to target. What that also allows us to do, as I mentioned omnichannel before, is start to connect the on to offline. So for instance, if I'm in Macy's and I can upload email addresses, I can now target those email addresses, send people to my store. As long as people at the point of purchase can provide you with an email address, which they're doing, now we can start to track on to offline, and we can start to influence on to offline. So again, we can put the ad in front of anyone we want. We can do that at scale, and we can track revenue. That's really what we have to be focused on. We have to be focused on customer lifetime value. We have to be focused on revenue and the ROI. And the last piece, of course, here is, is just the tracking. So the last piece I like to leave people with is that just on Facebook alone, there's over a Google targeting combinations. OK. Well, that was um, pretty amazing. And, and like if the composition of a good panel is getting completely opposite people and completely opposite companies on the same panel, I think we have that. Um, w th that is, I'm just blown away by that, Dan. So um, my company's called vSnap. It's a, it's a tool for um, basically kind of bringing the human layer back into interactions with customers and prospective customers. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but, but really what I want to get to is kind of 
um, inviting you to think about a new way to use video to bring warmth and tone and emotion and enthusiasm and sincerity and all that stuff that doesn't translate in text uh, into the customer interaction. So uh, I'll just start with, with um, what we think about as the essential DNA of the people who work at vSnap and the people who use vSnap effectively. It's really about these kind of simple beliefs that um, in order to use a, a tool like this effectively, you need to be human and be focused on helping and keeping things simple and so forth. We can come back to that in the Q&A if you like, but I just put that up because this isn't sort of a hippie statement. What we're talking about is a behavior that's kind of radical, and, and so you really sort of have to believe this stuff. Uh, so I'll come back as we explain. A lot of people are thinking about big data. Nanigan's great example, rightly so. It's just amazing the information that you can, uh, that you can capture and, and use to your benefit. Our perspective is that um, where you really get customer impact is when you combine big data with big emotion. If you think of data as the information about your customer, um, you only really achieve emotion through the interface, whether that's a, a digital interface or a human interface, whether that's a phone call or a website or whatever. And so we kind of see this new way to use video as a, as a new interface with the customer that um, allows you to act on all the amazing data from companies that provide those services and bring this kind of human layer. So let me explain a little more what I'm talking about here. Uh, everybody's familiar with Net Promoter. You know, I love this, this quote from the, the um, Fred Reichelt book about the Net Promoter system. Business leaders have to find ways to enable frontline teams to delight customers. It's about, um, well, that really informs how we think about the problem that we solve at vSnap, which is basically giving people who are customer facing, usually that's actually not marketing, although often it kind of bubbles up to marketing. Often it's sales, support, account management. And it's about giving those people easy tools that let them make the customer feel valued, make the customer feel special. And uh, email and text obviously don't convey feeling very well at all. So um, what we do to solve that is we give you this easy system to record and share and measure quick one-to-one -one video messages. They're not more than a minute. You can uh, create these on iOS, Android, in the web browser. You can share a vSnap notification via LinkedIn message, via tweet, or via email. Uh, the recipient can watch it on any device without any download or registration, so it's frictionless on the recipient end. And then you can track uh, analytics. I can see if you watched it. I can see if you looked at other documents or files that I hosted on the same viewing page. So it's really practical just in terms of um, instead of, as you do with email, just throwing something over the transom and then you know, you're not sure if the customer consumed that or how they feel about it. Uh, with this, you get to kind of understand, did they watch the message? And there's even a little feedback loop where they can tell you it was helpful or thoughtful or amazing, as the case may be. So this is what we do. We give you this easy little system to uh, record and send quick one-to-one -one video messages as a way to bring warmth into the customer interaction, as a way to bring the human layer into the customer interaction, as a way to act on top of all the data that amazing companies like Nanigans are allowing you to see and understand and analyze and put to work. Um, how do people feel about that when they receive it? This is, this is what's so great is that <laughs> the, the expectation in the business environment is, is that it's noisy and it's largely impersonal. And so when you penetrate that with this kind of bit of warm you know, uh, humanity, people just fall off their chair. It just, it just blows people away. The, the delight that it creates when uh, not a, a faceless corporation is interacting with them but a real person and a tone of voice and a smile and all those things. It's um, very simple stuff, to be honest, but it's, um, it's very, very powerful. And so the emotion is really the important piece, and, and that's why I wanted to just show you some examples of kind of emotional responses. We have a name for this at vSnap. We call it the gushing response. So what we find is if somebody sends, you know, five, six, seven vSnaps, within that they'll get at least one gushing response. And once they get that, once you get a customer coming back to you and say, oh my God, you made my day, you kind of know how to use the tool. We don't need to educate you anymore. You get it at that point. Because how often does a customer come back to you and say, oh my God, you made my day? In our world, that happens a lot. Um, there are explicit benefits as well. Recipients take action about 40% more than email recipients. We've seen this in customer pilots. We've seen this in A-B tests. And sort of like what Dave said at the outset, it's pretty common sense. You know, if I engage you in a way that has feeling and conveys enthusiasm and all that other stuff, of course you're going to take action at a higher rate. We also found that um, when you're using vSnap with Twitter, retweets go way up. Um, and uh, when you're using it in a B2B context, sharing via email, referrals, and word of mouth, and that kind of thing go up as well. So there are 
measurable, explicit, objective benefits in addition to the emotional, qualitative stuff that uh, is really so important. I want to talk kind of about the big picture. Why is this happening now? Why is this important for you now? As Dave talked about, it's really um, the age of the customer. Is that Forrester's term? The, the age of the customer? I think they like that. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, so, you know, it's just this moment where if you're not engaging the customer in a, in a way that builds loyalty and builds connection, you know, um, you're in trouble. So we think about this, uh, we think about video messaging in, in this kind of big division. And what has happened in 2013 is we saw all these folks come along on the consumer side. And this real, uh, this, this new set of behaviors around how to use video in the consumer side of our lives really coalesced, really came into focus, and we love it. The numbers are huge, you know? And also, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, Apple has really stepped up their advertising for FaceTime. They seem to be noticing it, too. And, and suddenly, in the last, whatever it is, uh, three, four months, you know, FaceTime commercials are everywhere again, they're, they're pushing that because the market is now ready for new ways to use video. Well, from our perspective, what's happening, and we, we hear this when we talk to our clients, is you have um, you know, often young employees who are using video in their consumer life and learning new behaviors about how to use video. And then they come into work and they say, what's the enterprise-ready video tool, video messaging tool, for me to use to achieve these business objectives with customers or with partners or whatever. And, and so what we see is a, a new category of video that we call cap video. And I'm going to explain what that is. Um, customer activating personal video. So it's a category of business video that is defined by um, A, the fact that it drives measurable lift, and B, the fact that it does this based on how personal it feels to the recipient. So customer activating. It's about moving people to take an action. Uh, in the B2C context, that tends to be in support use cases in, in our, you know, for vSnap. In the B2B context, that tends to be about uh, client acquisition and, and account management and so forth. That's how it looks for vSnap. But I want to give you a, a little snapshot of CAP video that's broader than vSnap because we think, we think there's a whole category here. And so this is a kind of an ugly chart that I copied right out of a Google Doc. Um, but, but the idea is, is really simple. There's these three columns. And, and so the first one is triggered video. So that's rules-based. And, and the example that I like is the Wistia HubSpot integration, I think, is really awesome. For, um, this is not literally bespoke content. I don't record. It, this isn't content that is recorded specifically for Dave or for Dan. This is content that is recorded for, for a, a user that... Um, observe certain behaviors or, or uh, trigger certain behaviors, they visit the site X times or whatever it is, right? And, um, and, but it feels so relevant because it's really, the, the rules are very granular. And the middle category is what we do at vSnap, which is these are authentically personal video messages. I meet you here today. Anyone can challenge me on this, by the way. You give me your card, we chat. Tomorrow I send you a vSnap to say, hey, it was great to meet you and whatever I say. And, and so that is a, a decision that's triggered by the sender. Uh, in your sea of email follow-ups after the event, you'll have one that is video, and you'll say, oh, right, I remember that guy. You know, he seemed like not a bad guy. I want to talk to him more. So it's a way to stand out, and it's a way to stand out, again, by kind of introducing feeling into the interaction. Um, and then on the right side, anything that is live is inherently personal. So it meets this kind of customer. So, you know, you have live... Um, Google Hangouts and, and WebEx and GoToMeeting and that kind of thing. So that's how we think about this universe of uh, what we call cap video. And, um, and uh, I realize that's kind of an unsexy chart, but hopefully it helps to illustrate it a little bit. That is, um, that's really where I wanted to end up. If, if folks would like to try this out, it's free. Uh, there's a free premium trial if you decide you want to. Um, if you decide you want to uh, extend beyond the trial, you can use this code FUTUREM and get a discount that will last for a year. And, um, you know, my contact information is there. We're vSnap on Twitter. Trish is, um, is uh, super, super responsive. And so any questions you have, we'd love, to, uh, we'd love to answer them. But I think what I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about is this bigger idea of using video not just as content, not just in a broadcast way, but in a really, um, really as a communication utility that's asynchronous, or maybe it's synchronous, maybe it's asynchronous, but in a communication utility that's, that's fundamentally like feeling focused. It's about making that person uh, really feel that you're paying attention to them. 
So it's the attentiveness on the recipient end. That's what the recipient kind of takes away, and that's what drives action. That's that category that we're excited about, and I think is, from our perspective, an incredible complement to, um, to the kind of precision and analytics and, and like amazing information that companies like Nanigans and many others provide in different domains. Hopefully that's um, helpful. Inside of sales, time is the earnest money of consideration. And it's kind of interesting to turn that around, that time is also the earnest money of building a relationship. And uh, the question that this gentleman had about how do I get my feet wet is, uh, is a perfect question. Because culturally, putting stuff on video in a lot of organizations isn't a natural thing to do. So I want to talk a little bit about what I do, which is change management, uh, helping organizations take on these kind of new ways of thinking, not to use the tool, but to use the tool so that the company can be closer to customers. So the quick explanation of what I do and why I'm here is I work for uh, a digital experience agency called iSight Design. It's one of about 40 agencies that uh, Forrester recognizes that focuses on making these integrated experiences that isn't focused on a tool, that's focused on making customers uh, develop preference and uh, companies to become proximate to the customers that are important to them. We work with clients and we're uh, in Boston and Portland. So uh, essentially, uh, when we're helping companies make change and think about change, there are three flavors of change. There's improving stuff, which is uncontroversial and uh, often is the low-hanging fruit of the kingdom. Can we make stuff better? There's transforming, which is like the example of GE I talked about, or Walgreens, where the company doesn't change, but the way they connect to people changes, and it becomes more valuable. And uh, you're not changing the customer, you're really changing the way you line up to be proximate to them, whether it's the way you buy advertising or uh, the way you talk to them uh, in video. And uh, because that starts to touch customers, it takes more stakeholders. It starts touching on culture, which kind of, I think, was uh, the question that was implicit uh, in a couple of the video questions. And then finally, we also work with startups that aren't changing their culture. They're being born this way, you know, right down to their DNA. And Dave, talking about vSnap, having this kind of prime directive of be human is a great uh, example of that because I kind of cut my marketing experience at Thomson Reuters, which is a giant kind of monolith of a brand that hides the people behind it. And it's very hard to be human behind such a big brand. So the idea that there are young startups that just have that right right out of the gate is a different kind of opportunity, and it's one you know, where you're inventing a way of doing business. And right now, just like Steve Jobs kind of lionized design, I think, for a lot of people, there are a lot of CEOs that say, customer experience, that's wonderful, it's great. And uh, I saw a pretty big uh, study, and I can share, uh, I'll share its source in a minute, uh, that said uh, of 3,000 CEOs interviewed, 92, 93% of them said, yeah, of my top three priorities, customer experience is one of them. But then kind of the follow-up question was, how many customer experience initiatives do you have rolling right now? And about 32% of them had something rolling. So there's a great deal of saying this is important, but actually taking action is a pretty big cultural step because it means not just optimizing, it really means changing. So the research I was citing was from Oracle. Uh, they talked to just over 1,300 uh, senior executives in 18 countries. And when they started asking, why don't you have these customer initiatives going, uh, you know, it's people, process, and technology. We're tied to a legacy platform, and we're, you know, we're afraid that we may have to ride it to our death uh, because these little start, scrappy startups don't have legacy. Somehow they have an advantage, uh, even though you know, larger companies have brand and they could always jettison a, a legacy system. We would have to make people talk with each other who normally don't. And that's a liberating moment. When you've got managers who normally don't talk to each other about customers, develop a map of how they're going to change the customer experience, and people start to recognize, you have the same problem I do. You know, maybe if we pool together, we can make a change that you can't do from the bottom up, only, only from the top down. And then budgeting it doesn't line up uh, to enable this. 
So sometimes it's getting people together to conspire. So back to the CEO, the, the CEO bashing. 49% uh, of executives think uh, the customers would switch brands to have a better customer experience. Same product, just better experience. When you interview their customers, 89% of them say they've already done that. And 44% of executives think that their customers would pay more if they could improve the customer experience. But meanwhile, 86% of their customers already say that they've made that choice, that they're following uh, their purchases uh, based on the quality of the customer experience. So to some degree, there's a lot of talk about, yes, this is really important stuff, but there are not that many initiatives rolling, which means there's an opportunity to differentiate yourself. The final follow-up question that was interesting is they asked these uh, 1,300 senior execs, how much money do you think is being left on the table because you don't have the customer experience initiatives running uh, that you know you want to? And they said about 20% of gross receipts. If your company has a growth goal of under 20%, this may be the low-hanging fruit because it's uncontroversial. Being better in market is definitely lower risk than going into a new market, trying to develop a new capability. And it's amazing that there's this point of pain where people know that there's something important they need to do, and yet they're not doing it yet. And it's exciting to see people who start to. One of the reasons it doesn't happen is no one's in charge of customer experience in many companies, like social media, like digital. Where does digital live? Well, in marketing and support and across the organization. Uh, one of my favorite uh, CMOs got rid of the word marketing in his organization uh, by going out, he runs a ski resort, and he went out to the team and said, anyone who sets customer expectations or delivers on them is now a marketer. And we're going to have a marketing plan that involves all of these non-marketers who are involved in delivering on customer expectations because that's the basis of marketing, not communications of what we say about ourselves, but what people actually experience of us and then say about us. So there's kind of this mind shift that has to happen of it's not what we say, it's what we do and then others say about us. Unfortunately, without cutting through those silos, there are no shared maps and people end up having uh, strategies based on a channel rather than strategies based on improving a piece of the customer experience. Customers expect things to be integrated, not siloed. And just uh, last week, I was teaching at the Delight Conference. One of the fun things about being a, a strategist at iSight is I spend time teaching uh, in Boston, New Jersey, and occasionally at uh, conferences where we've got people uh, who make great experiences and uh, in that setting, we did a one-day workshop on how to use this framework that we're open sourcing and that we want to share with uh, brands, we want to share with other agencies about how to improve customer experience. And the framework isn't magical. It's getting alignment, and there's some techniques that we can share that uh, are helpful for people to get internal alignment, imagining change, and then figuring out what the people process and technology changes are uh, to clear the path for change. One of the takeaways from that session was if you do this yourself, there are four things you need to do to be ready. And one is the organization already has to identify that there's a reason for change. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of a clear motive. Senior leaders, and by senior leaders, head of operations, head, uh, head of uh, the company, head of marketing, head of IT, need to be lockstep involved in making a plan for transformation. It has to be driven by customer data and insight. And if you're not proximate to customers, you really can't transform to be proximate to them. So that's a prerequisite. And you have to be willing uh, internally to work on this vision. And people can help you with that, but it can't be outsourced. That vision really has to be owned by those key three or four figures. And the process is very much not pick a tool uh, or let's crack big data, is finding what the obstacles are to change. And it grows out of customer insight, business vision, fixing the culture so that people can work together and can govern an integrated customer experience. And technology's in there 
but technology really isn't the lead. Technology is often what gets blamed uh, for what organizations can't do or don't want to do, and it's uncontroversial to say the technology won't allow us to do it, but usually the technology's been designed to allow or not allow exactly uh, what fits the culture. So those are some of the tools that we're working on, that we're sharing, that we're teaching about. Uh, at the end of the day, one of the things that's powerful and I think unifying is once you have that plan, you can take the journey map and you can go back and say, how is it customers make money for this company and keep the company alive? And it turns out, in all the comp companies that I've talked with, I've only found five ways that customers generate value and their relationships generate value. You have more relationships, which Dan was talking about with uh, Nanigans. Those relationships last longer, so they have greater value. They increase in value because of upsell. They become more efficient because people who love doing business with you don't spend as much time negotiating price, getting rid of margin, or buying things you really don't want to sell, or demanding support that's uh, not paired to the product offering. And finally, this idea of amplification, which is not the cherry on the Sunday, but in fact is the context for the whole company. Because if the things that happen at the top of that sequence happen correctly, you've got people changing the context of the company by talking about how great it is, by recognizing that the company matters uh, in their lives. And that makes acquisition faster. That uh, allows companies to have much more forgiveness uh, when they do have a bad day. So this idea of actually measuring how customers are valuable and using these as a benchmark uh, for measuring the progress against improving the customer journey is a whole different way of thinking about business, of essentially booking the relationship just like you would book uh, an asset uh, that's been acquired. So that's kind of the flyover of take the tools and do something great with them. It's not about the tool. Uh, it's about the great thing that the tool enables you to do. So everyone, it's a Christmas miracle. We're done early. That, that, I don't think that ever happens at conferences, but that's what does happen when you're between people in the bar. So thank you again for coming, and uh, we'll see you in the conference.